The Bible talks about the righteousness of Christ. We know about the righteousness of Christ, and it's to be imputed to us, and then we have the righteousness of Christ. But what about what the Bible speaks of on the righteousness of saints? What do we aim for that he did, that he shows us in his book and demonstrated in his life? I get many of my ideas for sermons <coughs> from reading books, articles, pamphlets, in this case an outline by Dan Donahoe and an article by R.C. Meredith deserve special credit. Along with many scriptures, which are mostly King James Version unless I say otherwise. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, that gives us a reason for thinking of the things of old. And from ancient times, the things that are what? Not yet done. So if we look at the things in past Scripture and how they were fulfilled, we can get a bearing on where we're heading in the future. The thing that hath been is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. It's very hard for some of your friends and neighbors who live in the box to be able to really see this and say, yes, that's truly the Word of God. That's the way it is. Now, they'll say, yes, but, or yes, maybe, or no, that's just Old Testament talk. Underneath all that, he says, and there's no new thing under the sun. So we don't need to be surprised about what's coming ahead. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. When I give a principle, it's going to be the same principle all the way through. A lot of people serve the New Testament God. Some serve only the Old Testament God. But in the time of the end, there will be a people who will agree and understand that it's the same God. And all things said blend correctly. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, <clears throat> now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments, which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that ye might do them in the land whether you go in to possess it. They are about to go in and get the promised land. But there was a condition. And the one who saved the people out of Egypt, the one who opened the sea, the one who fed them manna when they would have gone hungry otherwise, that one has a right in a covenant to have a covenant relationship with the people, especially if they agree to it. And they did agree to it. Failed? Yes. Failed so much that they ended up in Babylon. Saved out of Egypt by God's strength. Later saved out of Babylon by God's strength. Same covenant. Failed. 80, 70. Spread all over the world. 1945, 67. Brought back by God miraculously. His promise. He'd bring them back. But whether they're failing again or not <laughs> to keep the covenant may be somewhat questionable. Now God has a people all over the world who are looking straight forward at God's covenant. But that's predicted and promised in the Old Testament text as well. And you represent those people this morning. And I'm just proud to be among you. Which the Lord your God commanded to teach you. Verse 2, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God and keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee. Thou, thy son, thy son's son, thy son's son's son, thy son's son's son, thy son's son's son, son, son. That's the idea. All the way down to the 144,000 final sons of the children of Israel. All the days of thy life, that thy days might be prolonged. You wonder why s some people just live longer. Now, God gave that promise to his people, all of them, back in the days of Israel. But his promises still stand. 
keeping his commandments, his statutes, and judgments, we can still live longer and witness longer and testify longer and live for God longer. In, in those, in those uh, testimonies and in those statutes have all the health principles. Did you know that? They're all there. We have every reason to live longer. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, that ye might increase mightily, as the Lord God of our fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Are we headed for a land that flows with milk and honey? Remember the things of old, because that's what's going on now. For thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Well, how do we do this? The words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. It's all tied together. It doesn't leave any loose ends. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and they shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Oh, I'm so glad for the people that teach the little kids here, aren't you? I mean, they're serious about their work. Sometimes I have a little contact with uh, Melissa and Sarah, and they're, they're, they're working through six months to provide a program to help your kids be educated in the things of God. That's beautiful. They shall be a sauna behind thine hand, frontless between thine eyes. What, what, where have you ever heard of something on the hand and the forehead before? You see, Satan's is just a counterfeit. God's is the real one. And thou shalt write them on the posts of thy house and on thy gates. We have a gate post right out the door here. And uh, uh, the statutes got weathered, and so they're gone. We tried to get them back before the meeting again, but uh, the commandments are still there on the gate post right out the door, uh, the 10. And we'll try to get it all fixed up for you by next spring. Deuteronomy 6, we're continuing. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he swear unto thy fathers to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not. Houses full of good things thou fillest not, and wells dig which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not. Does, does that sound like anything that might take place in the near future? Are we going to a land where there are mansions already prepared? And there is food already prepared. And we have all these things already, not only wells, but the river of life to drink from. Wow. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shall swear by his name. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you. In other words, he's like a husband that, you know, ye shall not tempt. Well, wait a minute. Lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee. Oh, great day. We wouldn't want that. And destroy thee from off the face of the earth. Ye should not tempt the Lord your God as he tempted in Amasa, where they doubted him for water, remember. Ye shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes, which he hath commanded thee. This is, this is what the covenant relationship was. You do this, I'll be your God. I'll protect you. I'll give you the food. I'll see that you have water and wells and all these things. You do your part. I'll do my part. We have a covenant, and, and you'll be on the earth higher than any other people. Praise God. You'll possess the good land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers. All we have to do is remember the things of old the things that have been shall be, and that God will not alter the thing that has gone out of his lips. The principles, even many details, are still the same. To cast out all thine enemies before thee, as the Lord has spoken. Is he going to cast the enemies out? Is he going to take us to heaven with a bunch of enemies around, or are they being left out? Enemies are left out. Same principle. And when thy son asks of thee in time to come, saying, What mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded you? Then thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt. We've been Pharaoh's bondmen on the earth. Satan's bondmen. 
And the Lord showed signs and wonders great and sore upon Egypt. Ten plagues. You see something like that in the future? Seven plagues. Same principle. And upon all his household before our eyes. You know, the Scripture says, Only with thine eyes shalt thou see, and behold, the reward of the wicked. What are we going to be doing? We're going to be rising to meet the Lord in the air, and with our eyes, we're, wow. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statues, to fear the Lord our God for our good always. For our God until the cross. Well, that's not exactly right. That he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. You'd be alive in the future just as you are now. Just as much as you're alive now. If we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God. Now notice what it said in between. That he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it shall be our what? What shall be our righteousness to keep all the statutes and the commandments that he gave that day? What has been will be. Remember the things of old, because that's where we are today. The righteousness of the saints, the statutes, the commandments, and the judgments. So simple that even a seventh grader can understand it. But it's too complex for hundreds of theologians. Wow. In Revelation, to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. <laughs> what right does she have for that? For the fine linen is what? The righteousness of Christ or the righteousness of saints? It's, it's our righteousness. Christ gives us a robe of righteousness. Don't be confused. We've all sinned and transgressed and wandered our own way. We know that. And God has forgiven us, and He's promised to give His faithful people, here are that have the faith of Jesus and keep His commandments, a robe of righteousness. But He's selective who He gives it to. The text says so. He gives it to the righteous saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are true sayings of God. <clears throat> the righteousness of the saints was never to be as filthy rags, as our text said. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. It's the same old story, the same old rejection by most of his people around the globe, and the same acceptance by a few. It's just that Satan gets so many people on his side from among God's people that he has to send them in captivity to learn their lessons. Three times is enough. He's done it three times. Not going to happen again. He's going to have his Israel. Remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is none like me. He's saying, I am God. I am Yahweh. And I'm saying, if you remember those things, you're doing right. No question. His things of old are not as filthy rags. The righteousness of the saints was never to be as filthy rags. It just turned out that way by means of disobedience. They were supposed to be a holy people on the earth, a holy priesthood under the Lord, just like you and I are supposed to be. The truth is, for whatsoever th things were written aforetime, were written for who? For our learning. The rest of the text says about us who live at the end of the world. So the truth is, what was taught back there and what was taught for the principles of God's people, what were they supposed to be living according to? The commandments, the statutes, and the judgments. Then what will God's people, faithful in the end time, be doing? They will be remembering those things of old. 
they will be what God intended Israel to be in the first place. The 144,000 will not stand before him dressed in filthy rags. Won't happen that way. Notice, and I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire. This is John the Revelator, end times. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, and over his number. Wow. That's where we want to be, isn't it? On the sea of glass. The number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God, and they do what? They sing the song of Moses that was nailed to the cross by most every Christian in the world. And the song of the Lamb. Both. Now, I mentioned earlier, about a week ago, to you folk, that I, I made a DVD entitled The Song of Moses. You should really, for your own benefit, that's why I made it, that you can see the Song of Moses all through Leviticus. His commandments, statutes, and judgments are referred to as the Law of Moses all through Leviticus, not just the crossing of the sea. And these people are going to sing that song along with the Song of Salvation through Christ. Will you be singing on the sea of glass mingled with fire? <laughs> Only two songs will be sung by those who will be saved at that time. I've read the Bible pretty clearly, and I have never seen anybody else standing on that sea of glass with a victory over last day events except those that can do these things. This isn't a small matter. It's the righteousness of the saints. The Bible says so. At the end of time, only the singers of these two songs will enter eternal life. Nobody else is there. Oh, do you think all the people in the past who didn't know these things will be lost? Oh, no, we're saved according to the generation we live in, just like Joe, uh, wasn't it? Noah or Lot was a just man for his generation. Yeah. But the generations are required to be bringing themselves closer and closer to God through the reading of His Word. The only way folk can sing these songs is if they know the words. They can't sing them if they don't know the words, folk. These folk won't be merely humming the tune. Hummers are like hearers only. They may recognize the tune, but they have not practiced the words, hence they simply can't sing the songs. The quartet sang a song. They practiced the words for almost a week before they sang that song for you. Otherwise, all they could do is hum it. The Bible doesn't say anything about hummers being there. For not the hearers of the law, and that word law in Strong's, the first caption is the law of Moses. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. People are being belittled, belittled by the higher educated because we use Strong's Concordance. Hmm. <laughs> Strong's Concordance has been the biggest aid for the laity for 150 years. But they have to belittle it or you're going to learn all this stuff if you use it. Notice, but be ye doers of the word, and not hearers, deceiving your own self. Here it says simply, we must sing the song. We can't just hum the tune. Many folks say, give a yes vote to the law of Moses with the statutes and judgments. After all, it's required of us in Malachi 4, set in last day's setting. They're required. But when it comes to doing what it says, they haven't learned the words. You can only sing the song if you know the words. The folk in the picture know the words. They sing both songs, and only they get the victory in the time of the end. Have what you've been learning here the last 15 years, do you find them, these things important? Praise God they're important. Can't just hum the melody. 
Leviticus 19, 15. Look at this. He shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. There's your statute. In righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. Now, in case somebody missed it, the obvious truth is that the commandments with the statutes make up the standard of judgment for his Torah-observant Christians. You see it? Some of the statutes in the context of the above text are, are pretty enlightening. Notice this. Respect for their parents. Keeping his Sabbaths. Have no idols. Give offerings from a free will. Provide for the poor with the dignity of work. You know why I added that? Because the Scripture has it. They weren't just to go in and, and have the farmer give his excess to them. They had to go into the corners of the field and glean. They had to do something to get it. It's a good lesson. Will not deal falsely, steal, or defraud. Will respect the plants of agriculture. Have nothing to do with spiritism, nor copy the mannerism of the pagans. I guess the worship service should be different. They will honor the elderly. And in all this, as verse 19 says, he shall keep my statutes. These and many more were to be their righteousness and their standard of judgment. So what is supposed to be your righteousness and your standard of judgment? Did the cross change all of that? The cross gave us the power in Christ to live those things. It didn't give us excuses to ignore them. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there's none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, the ancient times as things that are not yet done. Hmm. So for the Torah observant people, we see that the statutes and judgments are not only their expressions of rightnesses, but also make up their standard of judgment. Therefore, we are to judge in righteousness, that is, we judge according to the commandments and statutes of the Lord. In the graphics we've read from the beginning of the hour, the commandment statutes are declared to be the difference between the righteous and those who are not among his Torah observant Christians. Question. Did Christ maintain that same cloak of righteousness? Can we honestly say that we have the righteousness of Christ? Did he maintain the same righteousness as prescribed for the children of Israel? What did he say about it? Think not that I've come to destroy. What? And if you look up that word in the Strong's 3551, the first column says specifically of Moses. Don't think I've come to destroy that. But did you know that most of the Christian world thinks he did? Why, if he didn't, Paul did. He nailed it to the cross. If you think that, Get our DVD on Colossians 2. Doesn't cost much and is well worth the study. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall no wise fast from the law till all be fulfilled. And that law is 3551 again. Yeah, Christ did the same thing. We're to have his righteousness. And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. At the last of his life, he'd been through a lot of persecution. He was about to be executed. And when they were together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers. Oh, that's in rapt disagreement with much of Christianity today. The beast merely changed the holy days and the law. They say Paul destroyed them, making him actually look worse than the beast. No, he did no such thing. <clears throat> Dan Donahue wrote in his outline, when I heard that the statutes are our righteousness, I was amazed. I thought righteousness was a spiritual thing only God could possess. But Ellen White once penned, 
Christ taught that the Christian must be pure in heart and life. Never should he be satisfied with an empty profession, not hummers. As God is holy in his fear, so fallen man through faith in Christ is to be holy in his fear. And then from Acts of the Apostles, and at the end of the time, God will have a clean and holy people to declare his statutes and his judgments. And people are sitting in, even in this very audience, and watching over television and the internet, making decisions in their hearts whether they will be the clean and holy people that declare God's statutes and judgments. What makes them clean and holy? Their righteousness. They're observing the commandments, the statutes, and judgments that they teach. They're living examples as well as witnessing by word. Serious stuff. Now, the rest of my message is for singers only. I mean that. Neither for those who are convinced that the Torah was nailed to the cross. If you're among that larger group, my, you have my respect, you have my utmost regard, but the mess rest of the message is not for you. Dismount. Turn off your set. Change the channel. Do something else. Because this rest of this message is geared for those who are studying the statutes and judgments and the righteousness of God. Everyone has the power of choice. This free will power was given by our Creator in the Garden of Eden. And we don't deny it. However, the rest of this lecture is given to those who have chosen the God of the Torah. That's what this is for. You say, well, I sent it out of a satellite for everybody. Most of the people that watch our BETV are already studying the statutes and the judgments or learning of them or keeping them. Special audience. The rest of this lecture will be given to you. All others have the right to turn this program off at this time, and I have a little guy on the bottom saying goodbye. Okay? This is for you. We believe that the Torah was given for our benefit. That both Christ and Paul lived by its principles. We believe that his commandments, statutes, and judgments were not intended to be arbitrary prohibitions, but rather given as guidelines by one who is infinitely smarter than we are. One such statute has to do with same-sex marriage. We've seen some statutes already. This is one we're going to look at. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is what? That's important to those who want to follow the statute giving God. Pretty straightforward. Centuries later, the Apostle Paul described how higher critics of his day actually were viewed in the sight of Almighty God as professing to be wise. They became fools. He continued to explain in verse 26 to 27, For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged a natural use of what is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly or shameful, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. In other words, which they deserved. Now, I don't know what that recompense of error was. I have some ideas. Unless he's speaking of the judgment coming at the latter day, We've already saw in the Sea of Glass, those who sing the Song of Moses and the Song of Christ, both songs. Others aren't there. Perhaps he's speaking, well, I should say, however venereal diseases have been known since the days of Egypt. Perhaps he's speaking of the same thing prevalent in his day as it is now in our day. How even, even today, such activity can be even more self-destructive in the magazine Tomorrow's World, these sins are recorded. Studies have been shown that even apart from the terrible scourge of AIDS, which has killed thousands of people, men who have sex with men are dramatically shorter lifespans than other men. 
Some of this involves a higher suicide rate among homosexuals. Some of it involves other diseases that involve uncleanliness or cleanliness. Some involves the alcohol, the drug abuse, which is a common part of the gay lifestyle. I don't know what causes it. But what's interesting is that the mass media do not hesitate to point out very real troubling consequences of cigarette smoking. They may, that may shorten a smoker's life by a decade, ten whole years from a person that continues to smoke. Yet, but yet these, the same media, silent or even approving of what many doctors have recognized as a lifestyle that can shorten a man's life by 20 years or more. Recompense of error? Quite possibly. I don't know. Author R.C. Meredith asks, are Paul's words hard to understand? He adds that many professing Christian ministers seem to have a hard time acknowledging that God powerfully condemns such conduct. Where does he powerfully condemn it? Predominantly in the statutes. But of course they're nailed to the cross, right? Well, the ones we like aren't. My commitment on this is Torah observant Christians will neither promote nor participate in a conduct that is called an abomination by the God of the Torah. The Bible says in Psalms 11.5 that Yahweh hates violence. More directly, His hatred is directed toward those who are violent. In the Torah, Leviticus 6.2, those who get things by violence have to replace everything they've destroyed. Maybe that might stop a little violence. My counsel to those who keep the Torah is not to react violently toward those who may act violently toward you. I'm not here to judge those who acted violently, but to warn Torah-sensitive men and women not to follow their examples. Be people of peace whenever you can be. <clears throat> While Cardinal John O'Connor presided over a 1015 Mass, a multitude of pro-choice and gay rights activists protested angrily outside. Some, wearing gold-colored robes similar to clerical vestments, hoisted a large portrait of a pornographically altered frontal nude portrait of Jesus. You can imagine what that looked like. No, don't. You bigot, O'Connor, you're killing us, screamed one protester, while some called the archbishop a murderer. Then it got really ugly. Scores of protesters entered the church, resulting in what, in what may in the packed house of parishioners described as a nightmare. The radical homosexuals turned into a screaming babble of sacrilege by standing in the pews, shouting and waving their fists, tossing condoms into the air in the church, Recounted the New York Post, one of the invaders grabbed a consecrated wafer and threw it to the ground. No respect for the other person's religion. Outside demonstrators, many of them members of ACT UP, carried placards that summed up their sentiments toward the Catholic Church. Keep your church out of my crotch. Keep your rosaries off of my ovaries. Now that's pretty straight talk, folk. But most of you are mature enough to understand what's going on. Christ predicted it this way in our world before the Second Coming. But I never imagined it to be as worldwide spread as it is today. Pope Francis said today that he will not judge gay priests. Uh, this, this is the Pope that the church that Brother Dickey talked about that changed the Sabbath, that worships the dead, that brought in images. Now, homosexual priests are okay. Well, I'm not judging their religion. Okay for them? Fine. But not okay for the Torah observing man, woman, child of God.
The second to last book of the New Testament, the little book of Jude, the author refers to a certain Torah history as an example. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and to going after strange flesh are set forth as an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, there's nothing of Sodom and Gomorrah left. It's eternally destroyed. Um, I did find a little of God left over there when I went over with uh, Ron Wyatt once and, and dug up some of those uh, sulfur balls that are over there, so unique. Still have some here in a dish. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignitaries. Boston would be an example of even evil speaking of a dignitary, where they actually label the bishop a murderer and call for his death. In other words, the very things that we are known to expect to exist on the earth, we're living in the middle of it. Your children need to be taught from the time they're little, Torah observance, and the God who gave the Torah. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time. What time? The last time, our day. Who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. The lusts. These be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the Spirit. I'm not saying they don't have a Spirit, but they don't have the Spirit that you want as a Torah-obedient Christian. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. If you've been involved in a transgression, especially an abomination, as one might be called, God can forgive that. He can also give you power to live a different life. Okay, how about the mythology gay, uh, gay game? <laughs> I say gay gene, gay game. Clinical scientist George Rice article, Male Homosexuality, Absence to Linkage of micro, uh, Microsatellite Markers, and so on. In Science Magazine with his associates confirmed that no connection could be proved between any supposed gay gene and a tendency toward homosexual orientation. Just can't be proven. Dr. Dean Hammer whose activism first promoted the idea 20 years ago, has admitted there's not a single master gene that makes people gay. I don't think we'll ever be able to predict who will be gay, he says. In other words, our Creator does not and has not forced people to be abominable. They don't have to be gay. I'm trying to be helpful to Torah keepers. I'm not being critical of others. Inborn tendency is different from genetic structure. All human experience indicates that people may have a tendency toward alcoholism through their family heredity, a tendency to be fat or thin, a tendency toward violent tempers, etc. But if you believe clear biblical statements, you know that there is absolutely no way that the God of the Bible will cause anyone at any time to be born so that he has to go against God's clear instructions. That would make God responsible. And he's not. The inspired apostle explained, There hath no temptation take you but such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. In other words, God will never at any time force anyone to be an abomination. But if they enjoy those tendencies that they have, that they've inherited, if I enjoy the evil tendencies that I inherited, if someone else enjoys the evil tendencies that they have, those tendencies will enlarge, 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 enlarge till it envelops that person. And that poor person can't hardly do anything about it. It's written in the article, Same Sex Marriage, Tomorrow's World, page 27. No one should feel trapped in homosexuality, afraid that the same sex marriage may be lost, uh, may, may be the best he or she can have. 
Secular therapists, such as those associated with the National Association for Research and Therapy on Homosexuality, are available if needed. However, for those who want to follow the Torah, I also suggest a few serious talks with your Maker. Amen. You see, He gives the rest of us power to overcome our sins. He's just as big to help you and just as anxious. Now, I disagreed. I didn't really disagree, but one of our brothers was talking about the purpose of marriage the other day. And I don't disagree, but there's more. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant? And did not, did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one? Why are they one flesh? That he might seek what? A godly seed. That's one reason to become one flesh. So that we might have godly children. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. One sacred purpose of, pur purpose of marriage is to produce godly offspring. Torah Christians should be quick to realize that two men or two women living in an abominable lifestyle will not likely produce godly children. The truth is that two men or two women will not germinate any seed at all, godly or otherwise. What Yahweh intended for marriage partnership is quite obvious to the Torah observer. Now, sometimes he does withhold the womb so that she can't have children in a marriage relationship. He did that in the Bible a couple times, didn't he? Yes. And sometimes he has a couple slated for a work that is going to take so much of their time, effort, and heart that he knows children would not be best in that situation. He might seal the womb. I don't outguess God. But in most situations, one of the purposes of marriage is to produce godly children. Now, how do the children get godly? Through parental instruction. Through parental instruction in what? In the Torah. That's right. Godly things. Paul agreed to the purpose of marriage given in Torah. Therefore, I desire that the younger widows marry, bear children, manage a home, and so on. That's, that's what it's all about. When Yeshua said in Matthew eleven twelve 12, that the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, he was talking about the nation of Israel who chose curses and was reaping her choices. She, she, she was brought out of Babylon, but the choices got bad again, and first thing you know, she was scattered all over the world. Then she's brought back again. What are the choices today? We'll have to watch and see, and the results will be the same if the action's the same. It's Matthew 17, 11, that Elias, Greek for Elijah, must come first and restore all things. Really? What are the things that Elijah will restore? All things. The all things include the statutes and judgments that are be restored. That's why the promise is given in Malachi. I love the promise, don't you? He says, remember ye, talking to God's people, in the setting of last day events, just before the fire falls, read the chapter, remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. That includes the 144,000 children of the tribes of Israel. All Israel. Behold, I will send you, Elijah. Who's he going to send Elijah to? The Elijah message, whatever that scenario is all about. To those who remember the law of Moses with the statutes and judgments. There's no other promise. God is serious about this thing. We put it off because we want to be comfortable with our peers. But folk, the people who are comfortable with their peers and put off following God can be in dire circumstances in the near future. I will send you, who keep the law of Moses with the statutes and judgment, I will send you, Elijah the prophet, before the coming and the great dreadful day of the Lord. Friends, we are approaching the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Amen? 
We have a time of trouble before us. God is looking for a people who will remember the things of God of old, who God really is. They will remember that what He says, He's not going to alter. It's still the same. They'll even believe in the sacrificial system as Christ as our sacrifice. If the sacrificial system, system wasn't in somewhat effect, what would he be doing in the sanctuary? He offers his blood for you and me. Sacrificial offering he made at the cross is still available. And what about the wicked who spurn it? Who makes an offering for the wicked that spurned Christ? Nobody. They end up being the burnt offering. It's still, it's still happening. The principles are still there. And friends, I don't want any of you to be a burnt offering. I don't want your children to be either. That's why I preach this way. We've looked at several statutes, and especially one that is prophesied to be an important issue in the last days. And so it is. Therefore, I suggest a homosexual statute should be thoroughly understood by all Torah-obedient Christians, especially taught to the children. If parents don't teach them Torah values, there are those on the other side that will purposely indoctrinate them in an entirely different set of values. You've got to do your jobs. For some of us that are older, it might be too late. But we can try. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that you might do them in the land which you go in to possess it. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee, thou thy son, thy son's son, all the days of thy life. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do, not just hummers, all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Now all these things back there happened unto them for what? For examples. To who? They are written for whose? Our admonition upon whom the what? You see, there's a revival going on in the end of time. And God doesn't need 10, 50, 100,000 to begin that re revival. He doesn't need a church of a million strong or three and a half million strong or four million strong. He needs a group of 144,000 totally dedicated souls that believe in the clean, pure presence of heaven. He believes in Torah observant Christians. Like you and me. We're commanded to do all these statutes that he might preserve us alive, and so he will. It shall be our righteousness to do all these commandments, and so it is. They shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, and that day when I make up my jewels. You know, he says this in Malachi 3, after talking about the statute on tithing. He talks about a statute, and then they're going to obey it, and then he says, they're going to be my people. Nothing's changed. God is still the same. You long for that day? In the day when I make up my jewels. They're going to be a special people, a holy people, a dedicated people, and a beautiful people just like you. And all the people said? Amen. Amen.